going to get started. Um, there are 18 cases that we're going to be presenting, or that I'm going to be presenting with the assistance of Shannon. Um, seven of them are coming from us. Seven of the 18 come from us. I don't know. I don't know. Should we be celebrating or not? We'll get to it. Um, and three of them are coming from San Diego. So San Diego, whoop, whoop, whoop. We'll, we'll see. We'll see about that. Um, I, I will start by saying that um, you know, the way I teach the cases, I may or may not dip into some of the facts. Some of the cases, they really are about the holding and about the legal issue. And some of them are about the facts, so you'll see me dip in and out of them. If I forget certain things and it's your case, I invite you to raise your hand and, and contribute. It'd be great if this is interactive um, because you were there. You were there and you remember it well. Okay, so with that being said, um, I am going to ask Shannon to help me out. She's going to start. We're going to hit up jurisdiction first. Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. So, very quickly, we're going to start with referee Blackwell's case, N. Ray Roger S. Substantial risk of future harm. In this case, in this case, we have um, a, a bad smelling kid, basically. Let me just focus your thoughts there. We have a bad smelling kid who shows up in class Often, uh, the school is always calling his mom. Can you hear me? Am I good, John? Mm. Okay. So the school is always calling his mom that he comes to a school wearing dirty clothes. His clothes are too small. He's disruptive in class. They've tried to get his mom to come to the school. She, most of the time, she doesn't come. When she does come, she gets aggressive with the teachers. <coughs> The neighbors, as well as the school, um, as well as the school, uh, one of the staffers at the school, the security guard says that they suspect that mom is using drugs. When the social worker comes out to the home, mom's not there. They're very unstable. Uh, this case wound up getting dismissed anyway because uh, basically the point is that smelling bad and having uh, clothes that are too small is not jurisdictional. There was no identifiable and actual harm that was laid out in the petition. It wasn't pled. And the appellate court actually says that. They say in their holding, nothing in the record indicates that having body odor or wearing clothes that were dirty or too small placed Roger at substantial risk of physical harm or illness. There was no nexus cited between Roger's hygiene and any medical or dental condition. So he didn't have rotting teeth. He didn't have some type of hygienic skin thing going on that required any kind of medical attention. So without more, there was no actual risk of uh, serious physical harm to him. Yes, Emily? Um, did the trial attorney enter, um, ask for a motion of him did the trial attorney ask for a motion akin to a demur on this? I did not see that when I read through the case. So I did not see that. They entered a general denial to the child smelling bad? Uh, based on my reading, you may have to read through and see what the exact, you know, <laughs> beginning pleadings were. But I didn't, and I also wondered the same thing because uh, to me it does sound like the department may have underplayed this, but they did not. Uh, I didn't see where, where actually the, the appellate court did make very clear that the petition didn't contain anything more than his dirty, smelly, odorous uh, issues. They didn't put anything in there about mom being suspected of using drugs. I think he, he was born with a positive uh, test for uh, illegal substances, but he was 10 years old, so that was 10 years uh, before the petition was played. So, that is Roger S. Okay, now we're getting into, thank you Shannon, she's gonna come back. Uh, going into the drug cases. Okay, drug use without more. There's nothing more, there's nothing to the case, there's no facts that represent any kind of risk to the child. 
drug use without more. And, and, and it means what it says, without more. You can't have a single solitary fact more than just the fact that the guardian or the parent is using drugs. In this case, it was a legal guardian who had used methamphetamine occasionally. I put in this particular one that occasional methamphetamine use in a hotel without more is insufficient to establish substance abuse or substantial risk of serious physical harm. This came from us. It was at Div uh, Department 426 in Lancaster. Okay, well, the attorney who referred, I'm not sure if this is a label attorney, but nonetheless, um, it was a winner. Um, it was a loser in the trial court, it was a winner on the appeals court. Okay, so uh, I put in, the, in this particular um, summary of the holding, used in a hotel, just to kind of trigger for you, you know, the facts in this case. Um, you can use this case for any sort of case that you guys are going to be getting, but the, the, the particular uh, circumstance here was that the legal guardian was partying occasionally, six, seven times, in a hotel. The child uh, that he was uh, responsible for was never put at risk in any way, shape, or form, was always placed with relatives like we would do with any of our children when we go to party. Now, we may not party in the way that this particular legal guardian did, but we do go out. We do go out, we leave our child. What we do in Vegas stays in Vegas, we come back home and life goes on. <laughs> This is what happened in this particular case. The bench officer uh, focused in on the fact that the legal guardian lied a little bit about it. When he was confronted about his use, he said no. Eventually, he said yes. He also took remedial um, steps to make sure that nobody ever suspected that he was going to do this anymore and that uh, the child was never at risk and never will be at risk. Um, the Juvenile court, or the appellate court said, yeah, no, there's nothing here. And this is Division I. We like Division I sometimes. We usually get very, very liberal, um, very straightforward legal analysis from, from Division I. Uh, very simply put, occasional methamphetamine use is not substance abuse, right? Abuse is a defined term where it impacts your livelihood, it seeps into your professional life. There is a very specific definition that has been given through case law. Um, and what I believe Division I was doing was trying to push back against Alexander C. Does everybody remember what happened in Alexander C? Nobody remembers what happened. When Alexander C came down, I was, I was livid, okay? The parents were users for a very, very long time. The kids were perfect. The thing about what happened in Alexander C was that the parents were saying, well, we can't live without it. It helps us, it keeps us going, I need it every day. Without it, we could not do it, we're doing well. And so the, 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 the court of appeal was like, yeah, no, yeah, you guys, you guys are substance abusers, and eventually that's gonna seep into what you guys are doing at home. And in fact, I remember the child in that case, was with, they, they were presuming that the child was going to start learning that, yeah, you know, as long as you keep everything moving in the right direction, a little meth is okay, even for 30 years' time. Um, so that's what I think Division One was doing, pushing back against Alexander C. and then reviving Rebecca C., the case that we like from Miss Berger. <laughs> um, so, uh, short and sweet, make sure there is truly nothing more before RV for dismissal in a drug case. Um, the thing that Division One also likes to do, just going back, they always like to break out the analysis. Is this substance abuse? And they go through all the facts to see whether or not it amounts to substance abuse. Then they go to, well, what, are there, what about the risk of serious physical harm? They could find nothing. They tried a little bit about the fact that the legal guardian didn't know that the child had uh, developmental issues or, or educational issues. They're like, yeah, what's the nexus? And no nexus. So there was nothing more. So when you guys are arguing and you see the something more, be mindful of it that you may not be in LC or Rebecca C land. You may be in Alexander C. So just be mindful. Next case. All right, so I'm back. 
Okay, so I want you to take your pens real quick because I forgot to change this for my first slide uh, and mark out future harm and put substantial risk of serious physical harm. So this is the case of N. Ray L. W. This is before Commissioner Kristen Birdsong. And basically she was upheld here with a drug using mother uh, who actually took excellent, chair, excellent care of her child. Uh, this was a stunning case because the kid was receiving really great care. Her 13 year old daughter, this mom had help uh, from using drugs. So she had debilitating chronic body, body pain. She had some actual medical conditions that she was being seen about at Kaiser. And cocaine helped mom function better. So mom, and it's in the case, the Court of Appeals summarizes this in the summary of facts, but mom had a hard time walking, functioning, uh, talking, moving around and taking care of her kid without cocaine. But with cocaine, she was superwoman. So, um, so she wound up, uh, she, but it got out of control. And that's where the risk and the nexus comes in. So she wound up disclosing to her physician that her cocaine use was getting a little bit too extreme. It was getting beyond her control. And she actually sought help at Kaiser. There were two adult siblings um, living in the home with them. Nobody in the family suspected that mom was using drugs. They, they said that she was doing great, kid is making really good grades. However, here's where the nexus comes in. Mom had two DUI arrests that year that the petition was filed. So six months prior, she had two DUI arrests and she had a reckless driving conviction and that's what secured the nexus for the Court of Appeal and for Birdsong. Uh, and they said in their rationale and in their reasoning that it's not just about your private use in your alone time anymore. Now it's spiraling out of control. So the case was not dismissed. The court did make a finding that there was substantial evidence to support jurisdiction being taken in this situation. There was a risk of serious physical harm because now mom's drug use is not just confined to her private time, it's spilling over into caregiving activities when you start getting in the car and driving under the influence. Now you've got a reckless driving, uh, a reckless driving conviction. You've had, two, uh, you've had two DUI arrests, so now you're putting your child at risk by engaging in activities that are harmful for the child, and you're taking your drug use into activities outside of the family home, and that's where the nexus to risk comes in. Uh, but uh, at this foe, the child was declared. Uh, it was a home of parent mother order, and mother also challenged that. Mother felt like she should have gotten a 360B dismissal, and she raised the challenge that it was abuse of uh, Birdsong's discretion to not grant the 360B. Court of Appeal came back and said, ah, well, no, she didn't abuse her discretion because your drug use is spiraling out of control. You need to be watched. You need some more formal supervision than just a 360B. Uh, you started off with prescription drugs, and then you wound up taking cocaine, washing it down with vodka and Norco, and now you're putting cocktails together, and your stories aren't completely consistent about uh, you know, when, when you started, when you didn't, and you successfully hid this from your family, so you need to be watched. So uh, the home parent order, uh, instead of a 360B, was upheld in Birdsong's court. Any questions? All right. Okay. All right, so uh, second district again. So one, two, three, here we go. Division five. Um, so this was at um, Department 424, Marsha Matthews. Uh, it was a, our case. Um, uh, basically, in a nutshell, um, the juvenile court issued a custody order allowing the parents to share joint legal custody, physical custody to the father. It was the mother who um, had previously been the custodial parent. Um, she had two children. She, she had a domestic violence relationship, right? There was domestic violence in the relationship. And at the end of all of this, she didn't reunify. 
the father got um, child, his child, and the, the juvenile court was saying, well, let's do um, a joint legal custody between the parents. The father said, no, no, we can't do joint legal custody. Why? Because there's a presumption against joint legal custody being, the, being in the best interest of the child when there's domestic violence. And what's my source? Family Code Section 3044. And then everybody's like, what? Okay. Now, I, I love an ambitious legal argument. Lord knows I do. Um, and here's the thing with this particular case. Juvenile dependency is a closed universe. Do you guys remember that phrase? Have you heard it before? Yes. Closed universe. Where have you heard it here before? Barbary? <laughs> Barbary? Yeah. That's the first time I heard it. I heard it in Barbary. When I was trying to figure out how to pass the bar, and I got to the part for the performance test, and you're trying to write the answer, and you're drawing on all of your knowledge that you've learned in your three years of law school, and you're writing this beautiful answer, and then you hand it in, and it comes back, and you fail. Why? Because you didn't appreciate the fact that it's a closed universe. The only thing you need to use when you're doing a performance test is everything in the file. So here, in juvenile dependency, the only thing you need to use is the code. And which one? Welfare institutions code. Welfare institutions code. That's the only thing you go to. If in the welfare institutions code, it directs you to go to the family code, then you go to the family code. If it directs you to go to the civil code, then you go to the civil code, and so on and so forth. But you don't go to the family code unless and until welfare institutions codes tell you to do that. So, juvenile and family courts have separate statutory schemes and distinct purposes. The, oh, this is the part that I'm sure you know, I'm going to co-sign on this. The presumption of parental fitness that underlies custody law in the family court, it just does not apply to dependency cases. Our clients, as much as we love them, they are not fit. They are not fit legally. Legally. Certainly we are doing everything that we possibly can to make sure that they get back with their children, but they don't have that presumption. So you can't just jump to the family code. That's where the fit parents go. The fit parents <laughs> go to family court. They're, they just can't work it out. But they know how to parent. They just have a disagreement and they need a third party to step in. The juvenile court, which has been intimately involved in the protection of the child, is best situated to make custody determinations based on the best interests of the child without any preferences or presumptions. Not fit. You can't presume anything. So. You can't jump to the family code. Question. Yeah. I was, uh -oh. I, so I heard about this, and I was a little confused because during our domestic violence MCLE, they gave us a case that stated that the domestic violence presumption should not apply to dependency proceedings. I was just saying, during the domestic violence MCLE, we were given a case that said, I, I don't remember the name of it, it might have been Ray Sean. Okay, and they said that stood for not applying the family law presumption in dependency proceedings. So, and that's what I've been citing on the record and filing appropriate paperwork if need be. So I thought we already had a case that stood for this. So I don't- Perhaps we do. Okay. We have another. I think, the <laughs> court, I think the Court of Appeal is just doing its job to kind of hammer it in. You know, we, 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 we have to remember they're getting all of these you know, appeals. Everybody's filing all over. But this, know, could, this should apply to any family, not just in the um, context of family law workers and domestic violence. It should apply broadly to nothing in the family law code should apply to the WIC unless the WIC code's silent on it. Yeah, well, no, so the family code, Oh no. yeah, yeah it's the reverse, Got yeah. It. And certainly as we go through the, uh, the WIC code, I mean, we see, you know, go so, I mean, we, we can go when it says to go. Um, okay, I'm going to keep it moving here. Oh, okay. Moving on. In Ray E.W., second district. It's us again, Division 8. Let's see. 
Now, oh, ladles go head to head. Okay, Monterey Park, Bird Song, Department 422. Okay, out of state, home state, get it straight. And so, look at that. Speak of the devil, family code section 3400. That's set. We're there again? I thought I just said it. If it's not in the WIC code, you don't go to the family code unless the WIC code tells you to go to the family code. Okay, this is different. This is different. Why? What am I talking about? Out of state, home state, get it straight. What basic legal concept are we talking about here? Subject matter jurisdiction. Subject matter jurisdiction. Okay, NRA EW, the juvenile court had jurisdiction to make custody orders because a California court has already made the initial child custody determination. So, um, South Carolina, was it? Nobody, you don't have to raise your hand if you're here, if you were on this case. I think it was South Carolina and California. Mom lived in South Carolina, dad lived in California. Initially, they all lived in California, mom moved to South Carolina, uh, dad had nine weeks in the summer, mom had physical custody, and that order came out of Cali. They went to family court, they were fit parents. Right. Something happened with mom. When the child came for his nine weeks out here in Cali, he disclosed abuse. Thus begins the juvenile dependency case. The mother's counsel said, we have a UCC JEA issue, right? She lives in South Carolina. The child lives in South Carolina. The abuse occurred in South Carolina. Father's counsel said, no, no, no. We don't have a UCC JEA issue because the initial child custody determination came out of here in California. Mom says, okay. Well, I, I was doing the six months, you know, six months before. You know, everybody jumps to the whole six month calculation. Six months before the fine of the, or the commencement of the juvenile petition, he was in South Carolina, so home state. Okay, fine, fine. If I don't have the home state, well then its jurisdiction was divested from California, surely, because all of the facts took place in South Carolina, right? So here's the deal. The UCC JEA is always going to apply to every single solitary one of our cases. We just don't talk about it whenever we don't have to, right? So whenever I hear um, attorneys saying, I think the UCC JEA applies, I always say, eh, it always applies, it always applies. It's just, are you doing an analysis? Are you doing an analysis? The Uniform Child Custody Jurisdiction and Enforcement Act governs the jurisdiction of a California court to make a child custody determination. The question of whether or not California keeps the case is whether or not another state has already made an initial child custody determination. In this particular case, that had already happened. Home state was done. Home state was done. You didn't have to go there. Usually you're going there when you have these two competing states and nobody has made a child custody determination. Then you start working through the home state and that's when you start going to 3421. And let me just say, I'm not going to teach 3421. I'm not going to teach 3422. These statutes are incredibly dense. It is so much more than calculating the six months from the filing of, you cannot do that so easily and so simply. You have got to start from 3421A and wave your way all the way through all the different ways in which you're gonna try to find home state. This case touched on it and then it just got out fast because they were saying, well, we don't even need to do we don't even need to go to home state. Why? Because there's a child custody determination in California. It has continuing and exclusive jurisdiction, and California was never divested from its jurisdiction. Why? Because in order to divest jurisdiction, you have to go through a, a completely different weaving around. It's very factual, and the mom was not able to show that, to demonstrate that. So this case just kind of focuses you on when you start going into UCC JEA. It's usually there's nothing in the detention report that mentions a custody order. Then you start doing the calculations. 
But if you already see that they already have an order, you're, you're, you're good. If you want to start challenging the continuing California jurisdiction, then you want to start diving into 3422, and then of course you can start doing in, um, inconvenient form. That's further along in 3400 at sec. Okay, it's extremely dense. Very, very lengthy. I have to break it down and circle. It's in the conjunctive, it's in the disjunctive. It is a lot. It's a lot going on. A lot going on. Um, hopefully there's no questions. <laughs> Next case. Third district. We're out of the second. Okay, this is Sacramento. Retroactive ICWA notice is not proper. The juvenile court's ICWA finding made at an unnoticed ICWA compliance hearing was reversible error. <sighs> okay, so this is what happened. I'm actually going to pull the case so I can get it. Okay, the county sent notice. It was really good. It was complete. They sent it to the tribe. It didn't make it there, though. It didn't make it to the tribe. Um, they went ahead and held the dispo anyway. So. They held the dispo. They sent the notices out. That was good. The tribe did not receive the notice. They held the hearing anyway. <laughs> Thereafter, no notice of any subsequent hearing was ever sent. Then, the county resent the same notice. The same notice. We're talking about word for word, including the date of the hearing they already had. They just resent all of that. Um, providing the tribe with notice of a hearing that had already passed. The tribe did receive the notice on March 3rd. Then the court did something that I like, sort of. They had an equal compliance hearing to perfect notice. The tribe didn't know about that one either. Okay, so uh, the whole thing had to go, the whole thing was done. I had to go back. So it was remanded so that they can get the APA notices correct. Um, so first and foremost, um, I, I have to say this. Do not throw away your APA notices. I know they make your file fat. I know they make your file fat, and I know that um, they're very lengthy, especially if there's multiple kids. Um, and you, you find that part where you can just rip it, and it, you know there's one staple on the back and one staple on the front, and you find it right. Okay. <laughs> Don't throw away your notices. You gotta track them. You, you, you really do need to track these notices. Um, this one got away from everybody. It got away from everybody. They tried to cure it, right? I like the ICWA compliance hearing. I like it a lot, and so does the Court of Appeal. They always, they have no problem with you going forward on DISPO without making the ICWA findings. As long as somewhere on the record you're saying, then we'll come back and we'll fix the ICWA. That's a great thing to do, especially if one person, one party is saying, slow it down, ICWA notice is not proper, and the other party is like, we can just do it and come back. So you can continue your hearing, you shouldn't, but you can continue your hearing as long as somewhere on the record you're going to go back to those ICWA notices. Why? Because it's a continuing duty. It's never ending. You will always be on, at the ready for ICWA notice. Okay, so don't throw away those notices. Notices shall include the information regarding the date, the time, the location, and notices shall be sent for every hearing that may culminate in an order for foster care placement, termination of parental rights, pre-adoptive placement, or adoptive placement. Um, so track, keep your notices maybe in an expanding file somewhere else. Maybe you want to do a separate sheet on the inside of your file where you're trying to keep track of the dates, but as much as you want to just don't don't do that because the case will go off the track if you go all the way through and then someone files their appeal and then ICWA notice comes up. Gonna go, gonna go back. Second district. Lancaster, Department 428. In our court, this is how we do it. <laughs> Harley C. The juvenile court committed prejudicial error when it impaired mother's opportunity to present her case as a sanction for violating an invalid local rule. So this is a really dense opinion. Um, it was, it was, it's one of the thick ones. 
and there are more cases to come that are even thicker. Um, I'm going to shortcut um, to, to what I think you guys will, will need to, to know and to how to use this case. Um, I titled it, In Our Court, This Is How We Do It. How many times have you said that? In our court, this is how we do it. Or you heard, oh, it's, it's going to be papered over the, oh, that's not how they do things. It, 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 you just be mindful. What is it that your court is doing? Is it even legal? Is it valid? It's okay for the juvenile court to establish local rules or procedures to govern the, 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 the proceedings and to expedite, okay, the ability and the authority to control the proceedings. And it also has the discretion to impose sanctions. Just you've got to be mindful. Are they legal? Is this okay? What happened here was not okay. So in Lancaster, there's these policies, one of which is you file a tr joint trial statement. Forgive me for stumbling over that. I know nothing of any kind of joint trial statement. This is before or after my time. When I was in the courtroom, I filed nothing. I filed no joint trial <laughs> statements. Um, apparently, um, the recommendation at the time was to do a JCO, um, remove from the mom, place with the father, JCO, and minors counsel was like, no, nah, I want to keep the case open. <laughs> FR to the mom. So of course, minors counsel was like, all right, let's do that. <laughs> okay, they set it up for a hearing. It comes back. Minors counsel is like, I changed my mind. <laughs> JCO. Remove from the mother, place with the father, mother unmonitored visits. There was like a last minute or something like that. So mother's counsel's like, wait, hold on, what? Okay, I, I want to put my client on the stand, I want to put the child on the stand. And the bench was like, well, counsel, did you file your joint trial statement? No, I, I just walked in the door. He actually says in the, in the opinion, I, I walked in the door and I heard minor's counsel has changed her position. I now would like to put on a contest. She said, well, if you didn't, try, if you didn't file the joint trial statement, I, I'm sorry. I, 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 I'm not going to allow your, 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 your client to testify, nor anyone else. Now, mind you, the trial court also said, any witnesses? Any witnesses? Did anybody give any reasons on? She said, Your Honor, you just asked me. God bless little one's attorney. You just asked me. If I, if any witnesses, I do, I want to put the mother on the stand. Well, no, try, no, we have a policy, you didn't file it, she's out. All right, you can't do that. You cannot do that. So the, the opinion goes on and on, Division 7 just went on and on and on and on about how do you establish a valid local rule. The court, this was an invalid local rule. It didn't even establish them properly. It didn't go through the, the right procedures or the chain. It didn't get any kind of oversight or approval, nothing. So the local rule was invalid. Then, the way that the court enforced it and the sanction that she imposed, you can't present your witnesses? That was disproportionate. Can the court impose a sanction? Absolutely. Can the court control the proceedings? Yes, she can. Can there be local rules? Certainly. Just do it right. Do it right. Don't do it how you want to do it. Do it right. What does this opinion not stand for? Don't use Harley C. To, stop, to say that this, there's a Sixth Amendment right to call witnesses and to a uh, right to confrontation. Don't do that. That's not what this opinion says. Do not use the, this opinion to stand for the, your client's Fifth, Sixth, or Fourteenth Amendment right to testify. That is not what this opinion says. And if you read through it, they don't touch it. This is all about the local rule and about the authority that the court has to control the proceedings and the discretion to impose sanctions. It was done improperly. And that's what Harley C. is all about. Okay. Moving on. Second District. Monterey Parks, Judge Stone, Department 409. 
Okay, so this one is a sex abuse case. The father um, committed an offense against the biological child. The disposition orders in this case was removed from the father, placed with the mother. Um, so that, was, that would mean enhancement services for father, yes? So the only issue really is here is visitation. There's two children involved. The court ordered visitation for one child and no visitation for the victim, his victim, and then put a cherry on top. Two-year restraining order. You can't have any contact with this child. Nothing. Father's counsel, well, wait a second. Um, you already said that my client can't reunify with the child. You already um, said there's no visitation. Do we really need to have a restraining order? Yes. Yes, that was reasonable and within the court's discretion to do so. There was sufficient evidence that any contact between father and minor would jeopardize her emotional and psychological safety. So the juvenile court was looking at things other than her physical safety. Because, right, if he has no contact with her, no visitation, and he's been, or in, uh, she's been removed from his care, he's not going to be able to sexually abuse her again. But the court wanted to do more. You can't email her. You can't text message her. Facebook her, FaceTime her, nothing, nothing. The evidence suggests that father would try to manipulate her into seeing him. Thus, there is a sufficient basis to also conclude that her physical safety would be at risk. And then the time doesn't the physical safety. Loved it. Couldn't help it. Okay. Um, so no visitation, no phone calls, no emails, no text, no contact. It's good. It's a good order. Right, moving on. Due process, not perfect process. That's all our clients get. Due process, not perfect process. This is not our district, this is first district. This is a writ. This is a writ, right up my alley, right? Um, the juvenile court can remove a child oh, from the parent's custody from one child's 388 petition requesting detention of the child and siblings. So get this. The children were home with a parent. Something happened. The minors council for one child, there's two children, each represented by different minors councils. One child's minors council filed a 388, the JV 180, asking for detention of not only her client, his or her client, but the siblings too. So parents are jumping up and down. No way. Of course the court does it. Okay? The parents are jumping up and down. You can't do that! First of all, it's a 388 from one child asking for detention. And court, you removed not only that child, but the other child. So they raised two issues. How can one child ask for anything concerning the other child? Standing. The second issue was you couldn't remove, at best, Your Honor, you could just detain, right? Because they asked for just detention. These are legal stand, legal definitions, right? You guys, detention, removal. Get this. They didn't ask anything about this whole 387, right? We would expect a 387. They didn't ask that. It's gone. It's right. Can't even bring it up. So here it is. It is within the juvenile court's inherent and statutory authority to modify or set aside its orders sua sponte as circumstances warrant so long as it has provided the parties with notice and an opportunity to be heard, which they did. They were on notice. They had a hearing. Due process. It's not perfect, but they had their day in court. And again, be careful what you wish for, not only at the trial court level, but at the appellate level. They didn't claim anything about the request to remove the minors could only have been initiated by the social worker via the filing of a supplemental petition in accordance with section 387. They didn't touch it. So what about the standing issue, you guys? Standing. The one minors counsel asking for the child and the child's siblings. So this is how they dealt with it. This is how the Court of Appeal dealt with it. And this is how you guys can kind of see it happening. You guys know on the, um, the JV 180, you know that, the, I think it's the, the, the last page, 
signature page. Does anybody object? Who agrees in all these boxes? Okay, so I'm sure it was like the, the box for the other minor or the other child, I'm sure it was checked. I'm, this, I'm just presuming, I'm assuming that. But then the, juvenile, the Court of Appeal, they get this record, they read everything, they read all the transcripts, they look at every single thing, and so they say, oh, we, we, we're mindful of, uh, that the minor's attorney for the other child, where is it here? Uh, her attorney agreed with the request, that's the boxes, right? Okay, um, and then at the conclusion of the hearing, aligned herself, you know? We joined, and they aligned, okay? Then it says, um, then she verbally joined in the 388 motion at a previous hearing, not even the one where the 388 was heard and opened it and, there was, and, and granted. Um, so the, do, the appellate court, when they review the record, they review the record. They're looking at it from the detention, the detention report, the petition, and they're going all the way through. The transcripts from the very beginning and all the way through. As long as, you know, appellate counsel is asking for it, they're going to read it. And they're going to pull as many different things that they possibly can to tie up and support what the juvenile court did. Um, so that's, that's something to look out for. 388s filed by your minor's attorneys. Ooh. Okay. You're on notice. Okay, I see it's 12.56, I'm gonna start. The hot chili peppers and soap challenge. <laughs> okay, so um, mother's children were removed for um, inappropriate physical discipline and physical abuse. She did reunification services, she got them back. She kept doing it. She kept being inappropriate. 387, pulled the kids. Uh, she says, well, wait a second. I'm just punishing my kids. I I'm just disciplining my kids. And if I understand correctly, a parent can, you know, discipline their kids physically, appropriate, age appropriate. The court's like, that's not, that's not appropriate in any way. Um, inappropriate physical disciplinary measures, and I'll, I'll tie this all up, violation of court orders and being extremely difficult to work with the service providers is sufficient evidence to support a finding that the previous disposition order has not been effective in the rehabilitation or protection of the child. This is 3rd District, Sacramento. Um, the parents may use age-appropriate corporal punishment to discipline their children. In this case, the court could reasonably infer that mother intended to cruelly inflict inappropriate physical pain. The court properly considered the totality of the circumstances rather than viewing each separate incident in a vacuum devoid of any context. That's what the mother was trying to do. She's like, well, I just put chili pepper. I mean, that's not, I mean that, that's not a risk to my child. It's uncomfortable. And this puts so, you know, it tastes nasty. Uh, but that doesn't put my child at, at, at risk. And, and, and yeah, I, I reached in her, her shirt, I pulled out a phone. Okay, but that's how she always has been. And it had never, ever worked out for her. So she continues to do this behavior. And so the court just tied it all up. All of this behavior, and then on top of that, you're refusing services, you're not allowing the social workers to come in, you're violating my court orders. Yes, but your honor, just violation of the court order alone does not put my kids at risk. No, it doesn't, but in its totality, you're done. We're done with you, you have tried your best, we're pulling the kids. You're not going to be able to parent. Okay, so this case is really about um, when you try to split hairs like that in court. What about the totality of the record? Again, the Court of Appeal is reading from start to finish. And you guys are sometimes looking at just your hearing, just the report from that hearing. <laughs> no, not enough, not enough. Court of Appeal is going to look at it, appellate counsel is going to look at it, we're going to see it all. Ah! Okay, six month, two, 12 month, 24 month review. Is it supposed to be six month, 12 month, 18 month, 24 month review? Isn't that the right thing? No, no, in Ray MF. Fourth District, San Diego. San Diego's one of ours. 
Okay, this is the Miners Council who appeals. What happens is uh, the juvenile court finds no reasonable services were offered to the father. Made that finding at the 17 month date. Okay, it was supposed to be a 12 month hearing, 12 month fast review hearing. It was held at 17 months. Made a no reasonable finding, um, no reasonable services finding for dad. So, what's the remedy? Kick it out. Keep on going. Go on, Father. Continue to get your services. <laughs> All right. So what's the court do? <clears throat> Sets the 24-month day hearing. What? Aren't you supposed to go to the 18-month and have that hearing, then figure it out, then go to the 24-month? No. Okay. The juvenile court was like, well, what's the point? Why would I just go just a couple more weeks? There was no reasonable services. There's no possible way that the father can be put back in a position to reunify within three more weeks. We're going to go all the way out to a 24 month day, give this guy a chance. Okay, but you know, the kid is three. And so you, you we're only supposed to go to 12 months anyway. No, that's not the case, right? You can go out to 18 months, and you can also go out to 24 months, assuming that. There's a substantial probability that the child's going to be returned. You can keep going, even though the child's under the age of three at the time of detention and removal. Okay, so at the 12 month status review hearing, the juvenile court is permitted to extend reunification services to a 24 month date for a child under the age of three without finding good cause to continue the hearing where no reasonable services were provided to the parents. So, what happens if the review hearings are held on time? Well, it's just the legislature that assumes everything is happening on time. We know they're not happening on time. And the juvenile court can find it makes no sense to just kind of do things so robotically. You've got to do things that make sense. The decision when to schedule the next review hearing is committed to the sound discretion of the juvenile court. Moving on. It's 101. <laughs> oh, okay. So this one says, the never-ending story ends. When minors counsel attempts to continue the case in perpetuity. <laughs> okay. I'm going to cut a little bit. This minors counsel could not find her client. I can't find my client. I've never met my client. I don't know how my client is doing to continue the case. <laughs> okay. When you are, or when a party is opposing termination of jurisdiction, the department is recommending closing, you bear the burden of proving that the juvenile court um, can't do it, right? And we're, due, we're, we're in 364 land where you have to find that conditions no longer exist or a, a supervision withdrawn. You know what I'm talking about. Yes? yes. You have to t okay, I don't, wanna, I don't want to pull it out. Okay? You have the burden of proof. So we, it, the, the status quo is that this case is done. It's over. It's gone unless somebody else can prove otherwise. And what this particular party tried to do was she tried to flip it and say, well, what you did, there was no evidence for you to do it. So that's not how it works. And this is really a case that's probably for the appellate level um, and how you're looking at the burden of proof and who carries the burden. Um, but in any event, when you're in the situation, the wreck is to close, Myers Council wants to stay open, you turn to Myers Council and say, Prove it. The floor is yours. Let's hear it. Miners Council can't do it. It's closed. Closed. It's out. There was a lot of facts in this case. If you guys want to talk about it with me, I wanted to talk about it. But I'm running out of time. The unorthodox way how not to return a child to a parent. And I love, or, unorthodox is usually the go-to word that the appellate court likes to use when something just did not, it did not go the way it was supposed to do. It just did not go the way it was supposed to do. It was unorthodox. It's the kind way of saying that they didn't do it right. Chronic departures from the statutory requirements led almost inevitably to error. Chronic departures. It was unorthodox. It was unorthodox, to say the least. Um, the juvenile court's order awarding sole legal and physical custody to a non-rehabilitated offending parent and terminating jurisdiction was an abuse of discretion. And boy, was it. This is first district. This was a plain vanilla 
mom who just, she was, she had substance abuse issues. She could take care of her, of her kid. The dad had had to go out there. He went to Louisiana. Um, while the mom was trying to get her act together, the grandparents were like, well, we, we need help. So they filed. And that's how this became a dependency case. Um, the father, he kind of stumbled back into the picture. Um, after a long period of time of the child having been removed and placed in foster care placement after foster care placement after foster care placement, somehow the dad rolled his way back in. I think I'm at my 30 mark, 30 minutes. No? 10 more minutes. Okay, cool. Um, through a series of chronic departures from the statutory requirements, and we're talking things that the statute, it's very clear you're supposed to do. Review hearings, legal findings, um, get a last minute from the department, review it. Make sure that did not happen. The child ends up in Louisiana with this for, you know, for lack of a better word, just an unfit parent, an unfit dad. Um, because the child was in um, Louisiana, I think everybody was just like, it's just too hard. It's just too hard to try to supervise this case properly. We're all here in California, and the child's there in Louisiana getting um, care in this facility. The dad, you know, He's not doing well, but he put the kid in this facility. So let's just say that the dad did what he's supposed to do. The kid's in the facility. The dad is horrible. And uh, let's close the case. So legal custody to the father. So physical custody to the father. OK, the, fine. the court shall terminate its jurisdiction. I'm going to say The court shall terminate its jurisdiction unless the social worker or his or her department establishes by a preponderance of the evidence that conditions still exist which justify initial assumption of jurisdiction under Section 300, or that those conditions are likely to exist if supervision is withdrawn. So no, no, no one did that. No one said that. The evidence was to the contrary. Mother kept asking for her child back over and over and over again. She was ignored. This is an extremely dense, um, factually dense opinion. I, I, I highly recommend, recommend you read it and follow how it just fell off the tracks. But at no point in time had the father ever participated, ever participated in his case plan. And at that, the case plan that was ordered wasn't even tailored to what his problem was, which was he's a sex offender. He was a sex offender. He was a sex offender. <laughs> All right, so he never, ever rehabilitated, but because the child was in a facility in Louisiana and was getting the care that he needed, and it seemed like that that was a good way to keep the child protected from the father, they just closed out the case. That was not how it was supposed to be done. 364C, word for word. Don't let your out-of-state uh, client's kids or your client's kid who ends up out-of-state, don't let that slip through the cracks. It is not enough that your kid is out-of-state or your client's kid is out-of-state. Just go, oh. all right? There was some horrible UCC JEA issues in this case as well. Horrible. Chronic departures from the statutory reform. Nobody even bothered. And that's how we got this case. Where's first district? First is Sonoma County. <laughs> and don't forget also, don't forget, failure of the parent or guardian to participate regularly in any court-ordered treatment program, that's prima facie evidence. You cannot close this case. You cannot close this case. I know, you sometimes try, right? What if there's no evidence of the child's at risk? You can't close the case. You can't close the case. Okay, can the court make that order? Oh, so this is, um, the juvenile court has the authority to order visitation between a child and a non-parent. Um, so this is, you know, a, a, a stepdad. He was not the presumed dad. He did not make presumed status. There were no facts to support presumed father status. But he had a really good relationship with mom's kid. Um, the kids were returned. This was, um, he had a child with the mom. They were removed for a particular reason. They were returned. 
So mom has the older kid and the younger kid. Um, the dad also shares custody with the younger kid. The dad's like, yeah, but I really want to visit with the older kid. I mean, I mean, he calls me dad, and I, I consider myself his dad. But you're not the presumed parent, the mom says. You're not the presumed parent. You don't have a right to visitation. And the court's like, okay, let's have a hearing on this. So all this evidence comes out about this really fantastic relationship between this older kid and this father. He's like, this is a close case. It's a close case. Even she says, okay, you know, you're not the presumed dad. I'm not going to give you custody rights to this kid. But I am going to order visitation. It's a good order. It's a good order. It's a, is it a child's best interest? Yes. If there's no statute that directly authorizes the juvenile court to make an order, argue that the order can be made pursuant to the juvenile court's broad authority. Where do we find the broad authority? 362A. It's as broad as it can get. So if you guys are coming up with these really creative orders or requests, where your client is, I don't want the court to order this. Mm -hmm. I don't even know if the statute allows it. Yes, it does. Yes, it does. 362A, you just need to make a best interest argument. Just make a best interest argument. Mm -hmm. And why? Why when the mom jumps up and down? No, he's not the parent. He can't have visitation rights. You're not fit. You are not fit. But I got my kids back. Oh, no, no. A determination that a child is not at a substantial risk of detriment in a parent's custody in a dependency proceeding does not confer a find of parental fitness. You are still not fit. Sorry, you're not fit. So <laughs> normally we would listen to you, and yes, you do have a right to you know speak on the, the who has contact with your child, but you're not. Fit. So at the end of the day, the juvenile court can make that best interest determination. Okay. I don't know why I didn't do this one first. The fraudulent two six report and the fear of Rebecca Hardy. Rebecca Hardy is the judge in this case. Um, the first district loves her. They, they, they loved her so much, they quoted her and her fury all throughout the opinion. She was quoted so many times. Um, she was furious. She was furious. What happened was the department, when um, she said, when she um, terminated reunification services and set the 2-6 hearing, the department is supposed to file a 2-6 report that contains information about the prospective adoptive parent. That's, in this particular case, it was Welfare and Institutions Code section 366. 0.22 C1D. There's also analo um, analogous um, statutes found at 366.21 I1D and 366.25 B1D. That's the six month and 12 month status review hearing, and then the, the latter one is the 24 month, right? You turn reunification services and you set the 26, then the court orders the department to compile all this information in preparation of the 26 hearing. The department left all of that information out about these prospective adoptive parents. The prospective adoptive parents were, well, one in particular was horrible. Sex abuse, sex offender, parental rights terminated, um, convicted of all these crimes, went to prison, so on and so forth. So as soon as the, um, Rebecca Hardy, as soon as she um, terminated parental rights, the kid was pulled from the prospective adoptive parents and all this stuff came to light. She was Livid, and it's lit. all of that is all in the opinion. Why did it become an issue here? So the order terminating parental rights based on an incomplete 2-6 report, it violated the child's due process right. The child's due process right, not the parents. The child's due process right. And how it got really muddy here, and I see it's 114, how it got really muddy here is that there was no clear determination of whether or not the finding of adoptability was based on the child being generally adoptable or the child being specifically adoptable. There's a difference. There's a difference. And when the child is, a, when it's a specific um, adoptable child, the court must determine whether there are any legal impediments to adoption and whether there's a prospective adoptive parent who's able to meet the child's needs. So if the prospective adoptive parent has problems and you don't know it, and it's a specific adoptability finding, that's going to screw the whole thing up. Why Judge Hardy, after she unleashed all her fury, didn't just simply vacate her findings? I don't know. 
I don't know. But that's exactly what is going to happen and has been ordered by the Court of Appeal. Got to go back, do the hearing all over again. We need a complete 2-6 report. So all of us parents counsel, when we get that 2-6 report, we're looking for that, particularly if it's a hard-to-place child. It's a hard-to-place child. Because without this, first of all, the port, that portion should be in there. But if it's not in there and it's a, it's a, it's a hard-to-place child, then we're going to have some huge problems. Huge problems. Anybody else have to leave? It's 1.15. Okay. Um, you guys, there are two more cases. There's three more cases. Um, if you can't get the gist from reading the handout, email me. Come see me. Call me. I'm right here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.